happening. Excellent. Okay, we're recording. Okay. Welcome to Martin Robinson, my education expert and correspondent, who is um, going to discuss with me the uh, the implications of uh, a decade or more of plague for the education system. But before that, I should probably give you some background. And um, first of all, let's uh, uh, establish your own experience of coronavirus, which has been pretty hideous, I believe. Oh God, yes. Uh, I, I didn't know you were going to throw that one at me. Yes, I've, I've had a, a we, we, an early adopter, should I say, in a sort of mid-March. I thought I'd get there before it became um, the, the thing to get, you know. I was, yeah. Just, just try it out. What's this all about? That is the earliest I've heard of anyone who's definitely had it, although other people, our cleaner claims to have got it in the first week of January uh, on holiday in Hungary. She was laid low and had to cancel her return flight. Uh, I think she's just symptoms. stopping, trying to stop cleaning your house or something like that. It's, Probably, it's, yeah, fair it's, enough. <laughs> it's time they're allowed back now, so you, your cleaners are allowed back, apparently. We've had her so in, we had her in yesterday, and my wife has not looked so overjoyed for a very long time, to be honest with you. It was a <laughs> lovely occasion. What, what about uh, the symptoms that, as you had them then? You had, uh, you had something had, fairly conventional. No, it was a bit, bit non-conventional, um, so... I didn't have a temperature to start with, had, had cough, sore throat, and a really sore throat. Mm. Um, nasty sinus, really nasty sinus uh, infection, but it was just draining out of me. So it was a productive cough as well, you see, that, that's the interesting productive. thing. Productive, nice, yes. Um, and, and thirst like I've never had. I mean, being thirsty after eight glasses of water, thirst, you know, really, wow. real dry, really horrible. Um, tiredness um, and then feeling like I'm getting a bit better some very odd yeah, dizzy moments things like that um, yeah. diarrhea diarrhea it's not very nice to talk about it, they? No. Um, and, and then your wife of, had it had it in a more conventional manner at the same she time had it very conventionally before me yes so yeah she's she, she started less embarrassing and less sort of outre and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and all this time you had a 13 year old daughter in the house Yes, and she's sort of trying to um, cope with us. It, it's a very difficult start to... Did her say. sort of inner little women type kind of self-sufficiency, and was it, was it kind of that vibe, like, right, rolled up the sleeves? Yeah, it's, it was a bit of that, but also worry, of course, because you've also got this big worry, especially then as well, because people didn't know the severity of it. And yeah, like yeah. What was going on, and, and we were... This was before lockdown as well. So, so you were technically able to pop down the shops. Did you take advantage of that? It, I, we couldn't go down the shops. No. No. <laughs> we didn't go out, I didn't go out spreading it, no. <laughs> pop you in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> so actually, your daughter is away into um, your expertise for, on education, because when I was first introduced to you, it was because I was getting interested in um, the idea of genius and how we cultivate genius in uh, society generally and in schools in particular that would be one route to it because I was trying to write a stand-up comedy show about genius and uh, as often happens with these things I got sort of waylaid and distracted and the, the show lost focus <laughs> disastrously as these things do. You had an interest in in the school system I believe which you didn't feel was looked match fit to welcome into you, in, your daughter in. Is that, was that, was that roughly... How you became yeah, that, that's 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 pretty good. So, um, oh, I mean, I'm also a teacher, or was yeah. also a teacher at the time, um, and the I suppose the the misfit between what you'd want for your daughter, yeah, and what you actually get is 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 one thing. And as a teacher, what you see as being part of it, you know, from the inside, and also from my own schooling, um, I left school under a cloud earlier than perhaps I should have done, shall we say. So, oh, really? Where, how did that go on? Well, well... <laughs> Good to some details I, <laughs> I think the, the, the final straw, I think it was when, um, when I came into school um, not wearing the school tie and I was sent home and the next day I came in just wearing the school tie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the uh, the mask yeah. protocols, isn't it? Mask must be worn. Yeah. But that was part of the problem. Yeah. Part yeah. Of the problem. What age was that at then? That was sixth form, was it? 
that's that's two two months into sixth form yeah so um, you were expelled from the sixth form expelled from sixth form yeah but i i've been there i mean I'd, I'd given up a long time earlier than that so that um, i mean a psychologist might suggest that that was the point at which you decided to undermine the entire system might be it's yeah it's a, <laughs> it's a theory <laughs> but you went back to basics and this is what i was interested in you 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 investigated and sort of unearthed uh, a principle of education known as the trivium if i'm correct and the trivium is a sort of medieval approach possibly even an ecclesiastical approach to you, you, yeah, you describe uh, it well i mean it it's it, it's these i suppose if you look at the cathedral schools of medieval europe um but also what um alcuin brought to charlemagne's empire as well so so that dish the the Carolingian um, Renaissance and all that. Um, so we have the trivium as the, as the basis of all those things, but it also comes from the Greeks as well. I mean, I know it wasn't called the trivium then, but the whole sort of liberal arts tradition goes back as lots of things do in, in to the Greeks and perhaps before. It's mm -hmm. also very big in Islamic cultures as well. So that it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it has a wider range than just sort of the, the this narrow um, focus on the medieval curriculum but basically it's three things three things yeah. hence trivium um and those three things are grammar dialectic and rhetoric or as i put it knowledge knowing stuff knowing your stuff so a wider sense of grammar than just english grammar latin grammar but so yeah knowledge um and then dialectic so it's logic it's thinking it's discussing debating um conversing arguing all those things and practice as well, various other ideas. And rhetoric is communicating beautifully and eloquently and thoughtfully. So how, how this works out is you learn stuff, you think about stuff, and then you have to communicate it yourself yeah. to show your understanding, but also show what you, you, know, you want to create with the stuff you have been given. So you can, work I can certainly can see uh, how uh, knowledge in and of itself is um, is separate from the other two, but rhetoric and argument are to some extent interlocked, aren't they? You have to develop rhetorical skills in order to present your argument at a suitable yeah, I would pitch. Argue all, the three, person... all three are interlinked because right. it's difficult to argue if you don't know what you're arguing about. No, um, and it's difficult to sort of. But you could you everything. could develop knowledge. You could grasp grammar through somebody else's capacity for rhetoric you could or either written or, or spoken you could grasp understanding but not be able to argue it or communicate it but to have any skill in rhetoric you need to have developed argument and vice versa right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 and uh, yeah. but uh, the it's it, i describe it in my book about it's a bit like a three-legged stool you take away one mm. leg and it just collapses yeah so you can you can have knowledge you can know stuff but if you can't argue it and think it's true um and and communicate about it then then your understanding is perhaps at a, a, a lesser level than perhaps one would like so now you, yeah go on. so you you learning by comedy for example yeah you know more about comedy through doing it than anyone who's never done it would do yeah they might know different things about it but they wouldn't you know you 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 have a different level of knowledge about it but would I be able to communicate that knowledge? That's a different skill again, isn't it? And of course, there is always that suspicion that people who end up teaching things are those who've tried to do it and have grasped the principles, but somehow lack some ingredients. I don't know what you're trying to say about me. <laughs> now, what I do think is interesting about this is that a lot of people, depending on your, pre your, your uh, predisposition and your temperament possibly and, and your, your politics and all the rest of it, some people will hear that and go, yes, that sounds like a good education system instead of nowadays when they just blah, blah, blah. And, but uh, other people might say, well, that is kind of the approach that any school will take because when you take an exam, you are being tested on your, your capacity to demonstrate that you've accumulated the knowledge and also that you can communicate it and argue about it. But of course, it's a question of effectiveness but would, would you argue those principles have been abandoned in school at the moment yeah i'm um, certainly um over the time that i was teaching i saw it i saw pupils know less but be able to get higher grades mm -hmm. um and a lot of that was because of i suppose the the 
the way that assessment just took over. So grades, 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 league tables, all these things, accountability comes highly in. And, and everyone sort of starts teaching very narrowly to the test. And we end up with kids answering questions as the exam board wants them to answer more and more, getting higher and higher grades, but being educated right at that point. The, what's the exam board asking for? Yeah. So the, the, yeah. Whole, the whole exam, if you like, takes over the subject. So you, instead of a wide breadth of knowledge, you end up with this very small, narrow focus on what the exam board are asking for, etc. So if the exam board asks you to read one novel, yeah. you might just be doing one novel for the entire secondary school experience. You know? <laughs> that, that, and then you can and, learn and all the correct critical responses to it as well, can't you? It's very easy to do that and never have to... Uh think for yourself on that at all do you do you think that is uh, reflects a, a, a kind of a collapse of morale in in the education system or, or a, 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 the grade inflation and so on or do you think they're working with less promising material you know in, to be blunt about the, the, you know what you do see in the 1960s you see in a, a maths o level paper now what oh, you know what is expected from a from a pupil at the age of 16 it's terrifying i mean the complexity the 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 uh, and the abruptness as well of you know the demands being made on got to, yeah you've also got to take into account the number of kids who take gcse's mm. is nearly everyone the people who took yeah. o levels and i can't uh, you've thrown this at me so i can't yeah. remember i think it's something like 7 to 10% something like that to oh really I think I'm, it might be more. I, yeah, I, it might be more, but it was. Oh, so it was already a self-selecting elite in that sense. Yeah, it was certainly because you had O levels and CSEs. Yes, okay. Up until the eighties, at some point, it became um, GCSEs came in with Kenneth Baker. I think I, you, uh, I've got to look. Yeah, I've yeah. got to do my homework. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't expect a test. <laughs> um, but uh, but the. the it, the GCSE took away the CSE that took away the yeah. O level and, and sort of created exam. But a maths exam, for instance, has three papers, a lower, well, did have a lower medium paper and a higher paper. But um, but now I think it's just the, the two with it. But um, yeah, so the, the, the range is certainly wider. And I think as it, if you take a maths exam, you slowly sort of whittle away people as they go through it. <laughs> yeah. By the time you get to the end of it, you know, just the few survivors sort of Who slogging made it through. <laughs> Do you think it's also, I mean, maths is obviously that uh, you could argue it's an outlier anyway compared to humanities and geography and history and so on, where it's possible to have meaningful conversations without being ex exceptional about it, whereas maths a lot of kids just find themselves in the woods very quickly, my own included. But I do get the sense that even in subjects like history, where you would hope to open up conversations, debates very quickly and say, well, listen, you know, Henry VIII, was he right to break from Rome? Was it justified? You know, were they right to disestablish the monasteries and so on? There's a feeling that that doesn't really happen now either, right? That even even in subjects where where even with mixed ability groups, you would be able to have some sort of uh, constructive debate. Also, with something like history or, or or certain subjects, because of the concentration on maths and English, mm. history is thought perhaps once a week, once or twice a week. You know, so right. in, in in key stage three, so you've got such a narrow amount of time to look at something like that as well mm. because um it's all maths and english so you know <laughs> those are the important right. subjects so and yeah. science and science let's forget that so you've got you know the, the, there's been a slight imbalance of uh, where where things i think we used to have again i'd be interested in the facts of this before i spout off it sounds like i know what i'm talking about probably wrong but i think there's been a narrowing of the amount of time in some schools, not all schools, in some schools for the amount on humanities and arts. And, and humanities is sometimes called humanities, after all, as well. Yeah, so you have yeah. humanities, which is sometimes geography, history and RE all bundled together sometimes, you know. So, wow, so you have it's a single subject. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, of course, then kids finish, in, in some kids finish the study of history in year eight at the end of year eight and they never wow. do it again. 
at the age yeah. of 12. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then on top of that, you've got class sizes, I guess, which uh, this is what people pay for when they go to private school, of course, isn't it? There's probably, that's probably one of the two or three concrete advantages of a private school is the class sizes are about two thirds of that that you probably encounter in the state system. Yeah, there's research on this that says in terms of measurement, in terms of the quality of results, et cetera, et cetera, there is no evidence that smaller class sizes um, impact on higher grades. Um, there right. are examples around the world, Singapore, for example, of where class sizes are 60, you know, at that point. Right, but, yeah. Uh, but with that, you, teachers have more time to prepare lessons and to give feedback and other things as well so it, it doesn't necessarily correlate mm. um the, the i was thinking in particular i mean in terms of grades of course that might not be a problem but in terms of mm. the kind of education that you were originally thinking of which is yeah the, the trivium in which people learn to to debate it must surely realistically have an impact on their capacity to try and argue and to learn through practice and experience the ability to try and convince somebody i think i think a class size of 30 is quite fine for that okay and but but and you can have too few in a class can you imagine six shy people sitting in front of you well, trying we, to get them to go? <laughs> you know? looked at a school uh for our son that was in lewis and the sixth form some of the class sizes were literally one yeah, uh, they had one boy who was learning German, and facing him was the German teacher. They were just—it was weird. I mean, it was like a viva permanent. permanent. Um, so, because I mean, one of the things I was—I suppose that I'm um, trying to steer you towards, but having to accept that you're <laughs> not necessarily giving me the answers. One is I'm quite interested what the implications are for what might become uh, an awareness that parents might have of what the what alternative means of education might be i think a lot of parents at the moment are are simply desperate to see their children go back to school for all kinds of reasons to get them out of the house basically out of their hair and from under their feet and also to reintroduce them into social groups and so on but in terms of the education that they receive I have spoken to some parents, especially with younger children, who are aware that they're probably getting quite a lot more constructive education, actually through the e-schooling mechanisms and so on. And indeed, if you've got the time to do it, a little bit of homeschooling now. And they're sort of probably confronting, perhaps for the first time, the extent to which their children are basically kenneled for the day rather than actually educated when they go off to a lot of what passes for school. Yeah. I mean, I don't know who you've been talking to, of course, and what they've, what they've been saying and what they're... they're I'm not going to name my neighbours and sources oh. and embarrass them, but... <laughs> and which school and what they're delivering. Yeah. Um, I, th I, I think the, um, the speed with which schools have had to turn this round, you know, suddenly become experts in putting things online and, and yeah. you know, three, three days beforehand, they probably never heard of Zoom. Now they're some schools are doing lessons on it other schools just providing material for kids to work through yeah um, i think it depends on the age as well but there's a wide range of things out there i i think the difficulty is is sustaining it and i you know and kids interest in it as well and about how how to sustain over this period of time if if schools go back in september secondary mm -hmm. schools you know um will they go back with everyone then as well you know and and mm. year 11 and year 13 you know some schools are teaching them still other schools are not you know they just yeah. say right you, you're going to get your grade i know some private schools are sort of saying um if you want a good grade you know you want your grade and you've got to keep uh, <laughs> you've got to pay us money for this term and things like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's also that going on I, I don't know the the quality out there is probably hugely varied and yeah. it's probably varied even within the school that you know some teachers are really grasping at other teachers or other subjects uh, work well more online than other subjects perhaps i mean certainly drama doesn't necessarily work no, as well some but... you need them to interact but i think there is some uh there's some suspicion in fact i would even go that far that some private schools are uh, see it as a possible new new area to expand into even if it's possible to return to conventional schooling as well because they would be able to offer what amounts to a sort of correspondence course version of their own branded yeah. 
education. And, uh, you know, the British education system is, is uh, highly valued around the world. If you can say you went to uh, Eton or whatever, whereas in fact you, what you did was sort of have Eton on, on the computer, you know. Yeah, it could be yeah, something that not? millions will, will, will sign up for. The wall game won't be so good. Yeah, yeah. and the beatings and climbing up the drain pipes on a, on a moonlit night, yes. that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> In your dreams. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what's your sort of, what's your role now? Are you, are you back into teaching or, I mean, obviously you're furloughed yeah, I'm, at the I'm, moment. Uh, I'm, well, I'm furloughed at the moment. So mm. I'm, From I'm a school though? From a school for, from um, from being a, a education consultant, you know, one of mm. those really vital roles, obviously. The last time I saw you in action, it, you came, there was a thing at the Brighton Centre, wasn't it? I can't remember if it was, uh, I think that was the private education sector, wasn't it? And you gave yes, a speech. The, uh, you gave a speech, I found it very interesting. Uh, you, I think you entitled it Athena and the Machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember this? And the idea do, was... Yes, it was only a couple of years ago, I think, wasn't it? Athena, it may be something you do every weekend, I don't know. Athena, in this um, comparison, was the sort of goddess of wisdom, right? Yeah. And, um, and a, a sort of a depth and breadth of understanding, whereas the machine was te you know, teaching to the test. Yeah. And it was your proposition, I think, that parents always say when they're selecting a private school uh, that they're looking for Athena but in reality they want to see the results that will come from the machine. Perhaps that's true I mean it's it's that's, that's an interesting um, thing because we had it we had a discussion didn't we? we had a panel afterwards and there was yeah. certainly uh, a, someone on the panel who's saying you know results can I do think results matter I mean yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not against results but I think there are ways of doing results which just make it ludicrous almost because you're just doing the result and you're yeah. forgetting the, the quality of the learning that matters mm. and if you know and i think this is this is where we can we can look at uh, let's say we're, we're teaching an english syllabus so we can look along um, we've got um, a gcse syllabus something like that and they, they're saying this book this book this book or this book and if we choose the shortest book and the easiest book because they're most likely to get good grades, mm. then straight away we're taking that option of saying, well, let's not stretch kids, let's not get them to think about blah, blah, blah. We're already saying, let's get them through with the, the easiest route possible. My daughter, who is a, a really avid reader and was reading, you know, quite uh, adult novels by 12 or 13, she did GCSE English this summer, or rather she didn't, ultimately she'll be assessed for it, and one of their books, and I think they only had three books from what I can tell, one of them was uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Robert Louis Stevenson, which is a short story, really. Mm. I mean, I mean mm. it's very, very, very brief. And it has an interesting yeah. theme, and you can imagine them having a couple of interesting conversations about it. But mm. Mm. compared to, say, The Mayor of Casterbridge or something, I mean, it's, you know, the other one they had was Never Let Me Go, uh, Ishiguru, which is, a, you know, a, an interesting contemporary novel, but again, pretty thin. This is this. Mm. I was quite shocked, really, to discover that mm. the the, uh, the shallowness, really, and this wasn't the school, mm. of course, choosing these things, as far as I can tell. That did seem. Well, to it be is. It's, yeah. it's both because the exam board will have a list, right, and the teachers will choose from that list, right. So depending which exam board it is, have a look. You know, it's worth just going online after yeah. this and just having a look what the choice was. Of course, in the end, it doesn't matter. She needn't have studied anything. She was just going to get... <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, it'll be based in that respect. It has been worthwhile paying because it'll be based on the college's previous <laughs> results as well, I suppose. <laughs> I, but I don't know. I, I think it's a, um, I think it's a, a real problem for private schools because I think, every, I think parents genuinely do think that they would like a rounded education and one which encourages a sort of richness and and a you know a high fiber diet and all the rest of it you know and yet they know that it's horrifically competitive as soon as it comes to the point where you're applying for the russell group universities it seems to me come on well i was just going to say it seems to me that the a levels which you have to try and get you have to get good grades to get into university but I do think sort of too much pressure at this point seems to go into the GCSE results 
because you're going to get into your sixth form and do the A levels you want, generally speaking, and yet they start to experience that same level of stress, like everything is going to hinge on their, whether they get an eight or a nine, and it just isn't, is it? I mean, that's that's crazy. Uh, the the, I mean, again, this year is obviously different, but um, the the odd thing about GCSEs is that now if kids are staying till 18 do we need gcses that's that's the mm. issue mm. and why do we narrow down now to three a levels do we narrow down too early in this country is it virtually um, impossible to leave at 16 now then is it unheard of um it, it's it's becoming the school leaving age is is rising i mean right it's 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 tending to rise anyway. I, mean, I think mm. my dad left school at fourteen. You know, I mine mean, too. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's going through that. When I I could leave it, uh, I no, I left early. You know. But um, others, <laughs> yeah. So others now just staying on. But you can go into apprenticeships and and various other things and colleges and and all. They don't have to stay at no. normal education school, but they you know they're they it's it's a rising through. So eighteen will be the general school leaving age yeah now yeah so you're right GCSE should should take on a different um they should have a different a, a, a different approach that what they should be testing should not be you, you're not going to wander out of school with five O levels as it used to be and that would be enough to get you a job in a in an office or whatever it's not the same kind of calculation now right no no and um a levels big, are the big currency for getting you into certain jobs yeah but most of it you know i mean with the grade inflation i think you could work in fleet street with two a levels years ago and perhaps not even that now you have to have a degree you know or is yeah, it, or, yeah. or a master's or something you know just to get to get mind you there are fewer jobs in fleet street there's not even fleet street anymore. well it's not even fleet street but that's a, i mean the other big question in in education and perhaps this would be the last one that i want to ask you one but the sense that co college has become a racket that, that uh, it's a, it, the it's the classic kind of um, uh, government Ponzi scheme essentially where it's just sucking in actually it's not a Ponzi scheme I've misused that term but it's a it's a racket whereby uh, as soon as they know that um, you're going to be able to get a loan for it essentially it's very much like their house price inflation. It's just about cheap credit that boosts the price of houses in the same way that the price of degrees just shoots up because the government is going to give you a loan. And so everyone else has got one. And so you have to have one because otherwise you're going to look like a loser. Whereas in reality, 50% of current degrees are virtually worthless in the job market and certainly not worth saddling yourself with a 50 grand debt for. Yeah, it's a, an interesting book um, about this uh, i've forgotten the name of it it's brian kaplan who wrote it oh yeah remember the name. is it what, against uh, um, edu case against education yeah, yeah yeah something like that yeah yeah and 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 it's um have you got it there no i, I haven't no <laughs> it's just i'm interested in kaplan because he's very yeah. right about some things and, and incredibly wrong about others but but yeah so so his his argument is against against everything i think is important about education he he's very much against the liberal arts and, and, and all things and it's only for some people that, that, yeah. that whole thing um and the the education at school or all these things should be vocational right from mm. an early early stage so the old what CSEs were, if you like. <laughs> yeah. But a much more, much more going towards jobs. What are you going to get from it? And all those, that part of education, the, the instrumental part of it that drives people through, um, that should be the focus. And I think it's, it's a worthwhile argument. Should we go to university to get the job? You know, is it important that we do things that are, are clearly there in order to make us good for the job? jobs market or should we do something like ancient history or classics or things which clearly have no <laughs> use whatsoever yeah. like, except for a prime minister perhaps the thing is even those that. wouldn't be too bad ancient history classics was generally regarded as a test of your intelligence and your ability to grasp complex and quite abstract subject matter wasn't it and that's why it was a great route towards downing street or whatever many of them have the greats in that 
Uh, and even now, I know Latin is regarded as, as a highly valuable A-level if you're trying to get into university. I mean, it just is a great test of somebody's ability to think clearly. This is, this is you know, what a lot of it is. It's not so much those degrees, ancient history. I think it's much more like gender studies or whatever, isn't it? It's like kind of, it's, it's the, the grievance studies kind of uh, uh, areas or media studies. Those sort of things which are either essentially uh, give you the ability to sort of discuss society as it currently is, but nobody wants to pay you to do that. You know, it seems yeah. fascinating and it appeals to the, the ego, frankly, of, 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 a, of an 18 year old to, to want to be able to make their case and, and you know, march with banners. But that, that should be a, a, side, a side line if you're at university. I, I don't I, think that's that's not going to be that's not going to be at, at school level. I mean, you don't do gender no. studies at school. You might do no, I'm talking studies, about I'm talking about at university. I'm talking about when you're starting to pay to get into a college and then yeah, get, yeah. and then finding something that's utterly useless in the job market. And it has that feeling of uh, you are going to come up against the god of nature. You are you are trying to take you are trying to take on. There's only so far that the that the will of government or the people to make these courses available and to and to level the playing field there's only so many things they can do and sooner or later the job market will find you out or indeed the international job market will find you out which is to say other countries will have stronger economies because you know their productivity is that much higher because they're training their 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 workforce you know towards something that's of use for the society yeah. at large that's that's another interesting line of inquiry as well whether education leads to a, a greater economy and there's, there's some sort of idea that it's the other way around the greater the economy the greater the education that follows rather than the education is the driver though lots of people in education policy want to make it the driver the idea of social mobility and all these things that mm. you know that that education can be that driver i'm not so sure if it is that successful as, as a driver i don't think if you if i suppose it's a sort of george bernard shaw sort of argument you know, we can sort of make everyone speak you know make make Eliza do the tool speak proper <laughs> yes and, uh, right and eat cake proper that she's suddenly going to make her way up and if everyone's like that of course then you know then all, all the people like you are spending money on private schools and all that will say well hang on a minute <laughs> I, I spent all this money not to <laughs> I have a terrible fear I mean I regard it as money down the drain already and always have done but a bit in particular now that uh, I think if anything it's likely to count against them because I think it's very unlikely to have significantly enhanced their cognitive capacity or their ability to contribute usefully but they will be they will be judged by people who do think it should have done and so they will consequently be held to have to be in fact poorer relatively speaking to be poorer prospects because despite having all this money spent on their education you know, it's an absolute it's a black mark against them but uh, this could be it this could be the social mobility trick yeah. really it's about the immobility of those who should be already up there at the top yeah suddenly not able to get there because the hoi polloi have taken over so that, that would be a sort of socially mobile thing but even that you know the numbers in oxbridge for example yeah you know the, 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 there's, there's too much of the hoi polloi to go to you know even if the hoi polloi got every single place <laughs> we're talking so few people uh, you know it, it's very unlikely that it would change uh, the, the lot of the average bus driver you know that's true absolutely true yes and and uh, you know uh, they will of course turn native as well won't they the hoi polloi after two years of being invited yeah. to come and join us at the estate for a shoot <laughs> <laughs> martin i think that's uh, been a very productive half hour i've enjoyed talking to you very much hang on so. there while i end the recording so that i can speak to you and say goodbye properly but ladies and gentlemen i give you martin robertson tell us about your book what's it trivium in the Oh, Trivium 21C, and also there's one, Athena versus the Machine. So there's oh, they're two. both they're both books. Excellent, that's both fantastic. Books. Both available from all good online, the good online bookseller. <laughs> <laughs>